He was the multimillionaire software visionary that created the zip file format still used almost universally to this very day. And now, at the age of just 37, Phil Katz was dead. His life came to an inglorious ending in a lonely hotel room somewhere in Milwaukee County, Wisconsin. He had a home nearby, and the cops had been summoned to it at least once before when neighbors had complained of odors, insects, and mice infesting the neighboring luxury apartments. Once inside, the police had been confronted with knee-deep garbage, decaying food scraps, and much more. When they later found his lifeless body slumped against a nightstand in that dingy Southside hotel room, he was still cradling an empty bottle of liquor. A half dozen similar bottles littered the room. He was completely alone now, having long since been estranged from his family and now virtually a stranger to even the employees of his own company. His body could no longer sustain the abuse from years of chronic alcoholism, and he died alone that night of acute pancreatic bleeding. We need to go back to the beginning to put it all into some kind of context, so join me today for the dark side of Zip Files. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days, and I wrote the zip file software that has shipped in quite literally a billion copies of Windows. I wrote it at home in my den at night, sold it to Microsoft for inclusion in the Win95 Plus pack, bought a used car with the proceeds, and then they ultimately rolled it into the base Windows operating system, give or take some of the more advanced features like encryption that didn't make the leap from my shareware to their everywhere. With zip folders, when you double-click on a zip file within Windows, it merely opens up as if it were simply just another folder containing all of the files to be found inside. No messy command line switches or knowledge of compression formats is required. The zip folder software in Windows was my own little contribution to the world of zip, but I had nothing to do with the creation of the zip file format itself. That was the invention of Phil Katz, the author of the original PKZip program. But the idea and even the basics of the file format all have roots that go much deeper, buried in a complicated past that we'll unravel today. In modern computing, a zip file today is mostly a convenient way of wrapping up many other smaller files into one big one that you can send or download or move around more easily as you like. And because it uses compression, that package of files is usually even smaller than the sum of its parts, making it easier to move, store, and to transmit as well. And so, zip files today are primarily a convenience item. Back in the late 1980s, however, zip files were essential. I came of age in that period before the internet when the only connection to the outside world was through a dial-up acoustic coupler modem to a local BBS or bulletin board system. In fact, this is the Commodore phone that I used to access the local BBSs in my own hometown. And yes, it's rotary dial. You had to dial by hand and then when you heard the carrier signal, throw the modem switch to engage the data stream. It was all very manual and very visceral. The BBS scene was primarily a social one amongst early adopters and computer enthusiasts. A dedicated host computer, typically located in some other enthusiast's home, would accept calls from one visitor at a time, at least in those days, and they could join discussion threads, leave messages for each other, and so on. A large part of that social scene was the sharing of files amongst the users. With no real access to retail software stores and a varying belief in the logic of actually paying for their software anyway, most users found and obtained their software online through their local BBS. Those files would normally have been uploaded there by another local user who obtained the file somewhere else, like at a user group meeting. Eventually, the BBSs themselves would start to share files amongst each other as well, swapping files from system to system late at night on early proto-networks like FidoNet. In those days before access to any kind of global internet, ad hoc networks such as FidoNet were really the only low-cost option for sharing files or sending messages across long distances. Each BBS in the FidoNet network would call up its peers in town to exchange files and email messages, and then at least one of them would have to make a long-distance call to exchange messages with the next town over. Given enough nights to make all the hops required, your message could travel anywhere that the FidoNet network reached. Sharing files locally is all fun and games in America where in-town telephone calls are generally free. But once long-distance calls are involved, now you're talking about real money. And to help keep the cost down, Messages and files were bundled, and it was all sent as a big stream from one town to the next as quickly as possible, using the glacial modem speeds of the day. Of course, the savings could be increased even further if somehow the actual size of the files being shared could be somehow reduced. And soon enough, by 1985, the world would be introduced to the ARC program created by System Enhancement Associates, or SEA, usually pronounced by C. But I'm going to say SEA because I like it better. 
Arc was a program that could take a file and compress it by up to 50%, or sometimes even more, by using a mathematics pioneered many years earlier by David Huffman in a 1952 paper at MIT. In theory, compressing all of your data to half its size could save you 50% on your telecom bills, and so Arc caught on like wildfire amongst BBS operators and users. Thanks to the easy portability of C, it was soon adapted to Unix, the Atari ST, the Amiga, the VAX, the IBM 370, and many other platforms. Now, to a programmer like myself, David Huffman's 1952 paper stands in importance amongst the ranks of those by Claude Shannon and Alan Turing. It's only 12 pages long, and not only did he solve a problem that had never been solved before, but he also demonstrated that his solution was optimal and therefore could never be replaced by a better one. Not bad for a grad student. The ARC program by SEA Software, released in 1985, was a C implementation of Huffman's algorithm for compressing and decompressing 8-bit computer files. Those files could be text or binary, it didn't matter. In fact, ARC has no concept of what the file contains or whether it was English or even a UTF-8 file from the future. It just did the frequency counting, built a Huffman tree, and encoded the message. Huffman encoding works regardless of the language as it makes no assumptions about the frequency of the symbols in that language. The frequency counts are always obtained by analyzing the actual content to be compressed. The software code to ARC was made available online, but the program itself was not actually free. It was copyrighted software that helped pioneer the shareware method of distribution. Users could obtain and test drive the ARC software, and if they liked it, or if they used it in a commercial setting, they would be encouraged slash required to send in a nominal registration fee for a full license. There had been other compression software available before, such as an archiver named Zoo, but ARC was generally faster and had better compression rates, and so it quickly became the de facto standard early on. Perhaps surprisingly, SEA's efforts were initially greeted with derision by many BBS users, some of whom saw SEA as a large corporate entity profiting off hobbyists and enthusiasts, most of whom were volunteers. Of course, the biggest part of SEA was likely the kitchen table that it was operated from, so all things are relative. As a bona fide loner, Phil Katz's operation was likely even smaller yet, but he knew an opportunity when he saw it. He became a fast follower of the ARC program, improving on it by rewriting the performance-sensitive portions from C into native x86 assembly language, yielding significant performance gains on the MS-DOS platform. It was the compression and decompression code that needed Phil's own brand of careful optimization, a task at which his bright mind excelled. The rest he no doubt viewed as merely necessary plumbing, and it could remain in C. And that is where the problems would later erupt. Phil released his variant of ARC as PKARC, and since it was faster and was even a little cheaper than ARC in most cases, it caught on quickly and started to rapidly displace ARC in the marketplace, seriously impacting their revenues. Phil also released the decompression program, which is all that most end users who consumed BBS files would typically need, as free software. Thus, only people who wanted to decompress their own files, such as BBS owners, would actually need the full paid version. The orders rushed in, and soon Phil was making far more from PKARC than from his programming day job, so he quit it to focus on PKWare, which he'd given as a name to his new company venture. Tom Henderson of SEA Software was more than a little bemused. With no good deed going unpunished, it seemed, SEA's inclusion of the source code to ARC had truly come back to bite them. Attempting to avoid litigation, SEA reached out to Phil to offer a licensing deal where PKWare would pay SEA for its use of the ARC format, but Phil flatly refused. According to Tom Henderson, Phil explained that PKARC was a wholly original product, unrelated to ARC in any way except supporting the same file format. Henderson was unconvinced. In 1988, SEA would sue PKWare for trademark and copyright infringement. During the discovery phase of the lawsuit, SEA finally gained access to the actual code for PKARC. What they saw left them flabbergasted. Phil had largely copied the source code for ARC and then optimized the important parts in assembly language. But all of that necessary plumbing around the compression program seemed to have been largely lifted from the ARC source code. It was so close, in fact, that reportedly the comments were shared down to individual typos within those comments. If true, there could have been little doubt that PKARC had infringed on SEA's intellectual property rights. Now, you'd think that outright copying of the source code would make this a trivial case. And perhaps it was legally, but in the court of public opinion, SEA was losing. Despite the fact that the companies were similar in size, i.e. both were tiny, and even the fact that PKWare was likely more profitable at this point than SEA, many in the community saw it as a case of the corporate juggernaut of SEA attacking the tiny underdog of PKWare. Furthermore, the community had come to feel entitled to ARC and its file format simply because it was freely available. That the product was still trademark, copyrighted software wholly owned by SEA was lost on most folks. With the PR battle going poorly, SEA agreed to settle. 
PKWare would pay $22,500 in damages and another $40,000 in expenses. They also agreed to pay a 6.5% royalty on future copies of PKARC or any other ARC-compatible programs that they produced. Phil quickly turned his energies to engineering a new file format that would not be subject to royalties nor encumbered by SEA. To that end, in 1989, PKWare released PKZip 1.0. In the product documentation, PKWare released the zip file format, but not the source code. The format had really not changed that much from the ARC days, but it was a clean enough implementation that it would likely not infringe on any of SEA's copyrights. Thanks to a combination of public loyalty, fast performance, improved compression, and favorable pricing, ZIP quickly rose to become the new standard amongst the PBS operators and the community alike. As time went by, millions of dollars rolled on in. Phil had always been uncomfortable in his own skin and grew up something of a loner, often tormented and bullied by the other kids. He was close with his father, Walter, and the two would play chess together and even spent time writing code for programmable calculators in the days before personal computers. But Walter had been plagued by frequent chest pain, and in 1981 he had to undergo open-heart surgery. He was dead a few hours later. Phil took his father's death exceptionally hard. Already prone to being highly introverted, he retreated further into his inner world with only his computer as a companion. One thing that helped him escape the privation was alcohol. According to the Wisconsin Sentinel, Katz talked freer, laughed harder, and stayed up longer and dreamed bigger when he had a drink in his hand. Drinking brought a painfully shy man out of his shell. By 1991, Phil was having trouble with the law, receiving his first DUI. Over the next several years, he'd be arrested five times more for driving under the influence or without a license. There were six warrants issued for his arrest, including two for bail jumping. As a wanted man, Katz stopped showing up at work very often, and running of PK Ware fell to the company's hired management. Assuming that his home would also be an easy place to find him, Phil stopped staying in his luxury apartment very often. The local authorities obtained a search warrant to search the property following numerous complaints about odors, insects, and rodents. Inside, police found a knee-deep collection of trash, food scraps, sex magazines, porn videos, and various toys such as whips and chains. According to one of those tasked with the cleanup, it was a mess. I had been in that business for more than 40 years and it was one of the worst I'd ever seen, he said. It was knee-deep in garbage. There were bottles, cans, and rotting fast food stuff all over the place. Whatever happened to that man, he went off the deep end. The public revelations deeply hurt Katz, but ironically, the strippers he patronized and that he lavished gifts upon, and who were by now his only friends, rose to his defense. According to one, he was not a pervert. I swear on my Bible. He was the most harmless, most generous, most unselfish guy I've ever known. His family got him into rehab, and at first the signs were encouraging, but the success was short-lived. He rebounded into alcoholism even harder. He spent his time sequestered in cheap hotels by the airport, avoiding the police and having little to no contact with his family. He was dead for two days before they found him. When his mother went to identify his body, it was the first time she'd seen him in five years. His company would not learn of his demise for about a week. By now, zip files had become so ubiquitous in people's digital lives that news of his death was carried by the London Times, the New York Times, ABC News, and numerous other outlets. Condolences poured into PK War headquarters, first by the dozen, and then by the hundreds. That so many felt a connection to a man that had so few real connections is one of the paradoxes of being an introverted engineer whose products wind up being used by millions of people. Alcohol abuse is a serious matter, killing more than 140,000 people each year in the United States alone, making it the third leading cause of preventable death. It can take a devastating toll on one's health before that death occurs, so waiting for bottom is not an advisable strategy. If you or a loved one has an alcohol problem, there are almost innumerable programs available to help. To find out where to get started, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has a national hotline that you can call, 1-800-662-HELP. It's free and confidential for individuals and family members facing mental health and or substance abuse disorders. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. If you found it to be any combination of entertaining or informative, I'd be honored if you'd consider leaving a like and subscribing to my channel. If you have any interest in matters related to autism, Asperger's, or ASD, please check out my book on Amazon, Secrets of the Autistic Millionaire. It's got nothing to do with money and everything to do with living a successful life on the spectrum. It's everything I know now that I wish I'd known back then. Remember, I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. In the meantime, and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.